Hello, and welcome to this uh, Docker conversation about what's new in Docker build. My name is Dennis D. And Kevin Alvarez for me. And we both work on the Docker build tooling. So these are the tools that enable you to build your container images, your development environments, the tools that you often use in your CI pipelines and also in your local development. In this session, we will look back to some of our new features that we added in the past year and how they can improve your build experience and how you can to start to use them in your own projects. So before that, all that, let's start with a quick overview of all our build projects that make up the Docker build platform. So first of all, we have Movie Build Kit Builder Engine. And this is the heart of our modernized build story and a very scalable and performant builder engine with very smart caching capabilities. This is the component that will actually run your builds. Uh, it's a community project. It's not only used by Docker Build, but there are many other projects also using it. For example, you might have heard of Earthly or Dagger, or, but there are many born as well. Uh, next to it, we have a Docker BuildX uh, component. This is how we bring all the build kit features to the Docker platform. It has the same familiar UI that you know from your previous build commands, but now all those commands are powered by BuildKit. Uh, we also added many new features there. You can now build inside a container, you can build inside a Kubernetes cluster, you can build multi-platform images, you can build on multiple machines and so on. Uh, lots of new powerful things in there. On top of that, we've also realized that Docker build is very useful in the CI. So we've created many repositories for our GitHub Actions. So if you use GitHub Actions, we made it even easy to start uh, using Docker build there. And so um, as, as we are closing in migrating all our builds uh, to build kit, we have some news in here as well. Uh, about a year ago, we switched all our Docker desktop products to use build kit by default. That migration has been successful for with over 95% of the builds coming from Docker desktop using build kit today. In Linux package, in Linux packages, up until now, you needed to define Docker BuildKit equal one to use BuildKit or opt in in some other way. This pain is now over, as we have a new engine release coming. In Docker 20, 2204 beta, no opt in is required anymore. The default build experience will be powered by Docker BuildX. If you tip Docker Build, we will internally redirect that command to Docker BuildX build, so you can always use the latest features by default. There should be no expected breakage compared to the previous build kit opt-in. There are still an opt-out available with Docker build kit equal zero, a variant variable, and for cases where you use Windows container, for example. The old builder implementation is deprecated and may be removed in some future release. So, okay, let's get to what we're here for and uh, show some new features. It has been a very busy year. And as you can see, just from this one slide, we've added a lot of new things. We don't have time to cover everything in here. So what we decided to do instead is that we both pick a couple of our favorite features that we'll give a preview of. So Kevin, what is the first feature that everyone should know about? AirDocs. Okay. Yes, so let's talk about AirDocs in Docker files. Uh, that's neat features uh, that could bring, for example, uh, some enhancements in your Docker file. So let's see a Docker file in the wild. Uh, as you can see, uh, it, this kind of Docker files is something you can see uh, often on, on GitHub, on, on the Docker files. It works, but it's kind of messy and very readable with the logic and operators there. You can also easily forget the continuation symbol in this kind of thing. And it's kind of also hard to implement some basic conditional logic there. Um, so here comes air documents uh, that have neat features to enhance these kind of Docker files. Uh, as you may know, your document is a well-known pattern today in the Unix, uh, in the Unix shell, and its style string literals are found in various high-level languages. We use input redirection, as you can see, uh, to start to introduce the ear doc and the, the closed one. In between those, we put all our commands as the content of our script to be run by the shell. Now, let's improve the Docker file from the previous example with ear docs. As you can see now, uh, it's clear uh, that we that we have a, a clear view of our Docker file. We can separate commands. We can put new lines and everything you can do in the shell. 
as we can see also, uh, our Docker file is not easy to read unless error prone with this kind of logic we have there. Uh, this example, by the way, is also a bad one. Uh, a Docker file should not have that much logic. Uh, in this case, it should be moved to a dedicated script uh, in your repository working tree. Uh, we have seen some basic syntax. Uh, however, the newer ERDoc support that just that just not allow simple example like this. There are other things you can do. You can, for example, use a chaining header to define an interpreter like Python in this case. Another useful feature is the combination of ERDocs and copy command. This way, source parameters can be replaced with a redoc indicator so you can inline file content. This can be really useful for small files that don't need to be part of the context, but also to have a dynamic file content at build time, like this example. Remember that regular AirDoc variable expansions that have stripping rules apply there. There are other creative uh, complex ways to use uh, AirDocs in a Docker file, like multiple air, air documents, for example. More, more, more to come uh, and are available also on the BuildKit repository. Oh, and you can also use them uh, with run moons, of course. Uh, by the way, Tonis, uh, what are the new features available in build modes? Yes, next up, uh, we can discover the build mounts. And uh, the build mounts, what they are is basically mounts that you can add to your Dockerfile commands anytime you run your process. So anytime you have a run command, you can use the dashes mount flag and define additional mount points to give those processes uh, access to additional files. Uh, Build mode is not uh, quite a new feature. We've already experimented with this one in the past. But what has changed now is that we've now moved this feature to the stable channel. So you don't need to declare anymore that uh, you want to opt in to the, to the experimental features in the last channel. Now it's available to everyone. Uh, inside the build mode feature, there are many different features that you can use if you do based on what the mount type you're using. So there are uh, bind mounts there. So these ones uh, give you direct access to some of the files inside your build context or in other build stages. So you don't need to do those expensive copy operations to move things around. Then there are secrets and SSH mounts. So for its secret mounts, you can uh, access your build sec secrets safely with SSH you can forward your SSH agent. So if you want to access some of your private repositories or, or other resources, uh, then there are mounts for the temp creating temporary areas. And then uh, finally, there is very interesting mount with type cache. So with type cache uh, mounts, you can create the areas where when you process the sprite files, they will persist for the next time you run the build again. Uh, so this is very important with uh, incremental builds when you when you make changes to your code and then run your build again. So for example, in here, we have a simple Docker file. We're building uh, Go source code. And now we've already built this once. Let's see what happens when we make a modification to our source code and build again. So in here, with green check marks, I marked all the, all the commands that were already cached from a previous run. And with the red crosses are the things that need to run again. So as expected, we made a source code change. So we expect that the new source code is copied now. And of course, like the co-compiler needs to run again. But with the cache mount, when the co-compiler still has access to this previous directory where it knows to look up its own like co-specific cache. So this directory called the root cache co-build this is still there, it's still cached from the previous run. So your co-builder will now run much faster. So cache modes are very important when you're running lots of builds and you want to speed up your incremental builds. It's, it will give you like the host equivalent performance inside your Docker builds for this use case. And next up, we will talk about more about uh, some caching with, with GitHub Actions. So yeah, we, we talk about the GitHub Actions uh, at the beginning of this presentation. Um, as you can see, we have a lot of them. Uh, today, we, are not, we have six of them. Um, the most significant of these is probably the build push action to build and push Docker images with BuildX, with also for support of the features provided by BuildKit, of course. 
This includes a multi-platform build, secrets, remote cache, and different builder deployment namespacing options. Now let's see a basic workflow. Uh, this one will use the setup build this action to leverage new features like the GitHub Action Cache Exporter that we are going to talk about shortly. We also use the logging action to log in against Docker Hub so we can push on our image on the registry. Finally, we use the build push action to build and push our image. That's quite simple, right? Now let's see how much time it takes to build this project. As we can see, it's almost nine seconds. Yeah, so let, let's see the build logs now. Uh, yeah, as we can see, the build stage is not catch uh, and will be run each time this workflow is triggered on, in, your, in your setup. We can do better. We, let's see what BuildKit offers in terms of caching today. So uh, BuildKit has some remote cache backends available today. There are four of them. Uh, there is the inline one that writes cache metadata into the image configuration. There is the registry one that exports build cache to the cache manifest in the registry. And there are the local type that export to a local directory on the client. Now, the, the one that is interesting for us is the GA shell one that export cache through the GitHub Action Cache Service API. And that's the one we are going to use here. So bearing back to, to our example, now we are going to enable this cache in your workflow by, by using a simple key TJSHA with cache form and cache two. This cache saves both metadata and layers to GitHub Cache Service API. This is the same backend being used uh, by the official GitHub Action by GitHub. So let's build this project and see how it performs with these new options. Yeah, we save almost, yeah, 67% of build time, nine seconds versus three seconds. That's, that's great. Uh, looking at the logs, we can see the instruction linked to the build, the build R cache now. Um, GitHub cache backend with GitHub Actions is the easiest way and the most efficient way to take advantage of the build cache as of today. As this cache is smart, is smart enough to only pull in the cache that is guaranteed to match. There is some advanced cases that we, we, are, we are going to talk there uh, that are kind of important. For example, there is uh, the size limit imposed by GitHub today that is data in gigabit. Uh, it will save your cache, but it will begin evicting uh, caches until the total, si the total size is less than 10 gigabits. Uh, and also, if we if the cache is recycled too often, uh, it will be slower run times overall. Um, for scope, uh, the scope key is an attribute you can put. Um, this attribute can be useful, for example, if you use a mono repo or matrix workflows. The mod max is also useful if you want to export all layers and intermediate step, but be careful with this option um, because it can quickly exceed the cache size limit. If there is another cache backend you would like uh, to see in BuildKit, feel free to contribute. Uh, their, their contribution are, are welcome, of course. OK, now let's look about uh, another way how you can uh, add better cache to your projects. And this is with the new copy dash link feature. So before we get too deep into this feature, let's first like take a step back and see how the build cache works in, in Docker Build at all. So in here, we have a simple Docker file and the image that it creates. And the images are made of layers that are like a tarballs and they are extracted on top of each other and that's what makes up your container file system. So in here, we have three commands in our last uh, uh, stage in our Docker file and every one of those creates a new layer. But what's now happening when we make modifications to this Docker file? So for example, in here, we changed the last command, we made a modification to it. And as expected, we need to rebuild that command and generate a new layer for that inside an image. But important thing to understand in here is that cache only works top down. So for example, it works well with this last command, but if we want to change our base image, for example, so in here we'll switching from an Alpine image to our busybox image, then this also causes the cache to in be invalidated for all the subsequent copy commands. And so that's not really like what we want in this case, because that, that will trigger a lot slower builds. So for that problem, what we have tried to how we would try to solve it is by adding two new operations in the build kit uh, engine. And uh, these are called merge up and diff up. And these allow working uh, with independent layers so that 
when you make changes to a layer, it doesn't invalidate the cache for the next layer coming after it. And the way that it's exposed in the Docker file is with the new dashes link flag in the copy command. So let's see what it does. So in here, I have again, like a very simple Docker file with two copy commands. And let's compare what is the behavior if you use the dashes link flag compared to the old behavior. So on the left, you see the old behavior. So when we copy this full file, on top of Alpine, you see that it's put actually on top of the files from the Alpine, Alpine image and the same with the next file as well. And then in the end, to create the final image, we run like a process that's called a differ that will basically compare all those snapshots and figure out what the differences between them are. Now on the right, you will see what's happening on the, when we added the dashes link flag and you see that the behavior is quite different. So now when we're copying the full file, it doesn't go on top of the Alpine actually, it just goes to a completely separate location and lives there on its own. And the same with the, with the, uh, with the next file as well. And then once we want to make the full image, there we use this new merge capability in BuildKit to just link those layers together. And this is how the image is made. So now if you look at the uh, real world example, for example, here we have our Docker file back again. And let's say we already built this image once and now we want to rebase this image and, uh, and change the base image while using the cache from our previous build. So let's make a change, let's update the Alpine version. And you will see that changing the Alpine version in here did not invalidate the cache for our next copy commands those copy commands are still cached because they did not depend on Alpine at all. So in the right side, you will see that only one layer was switched and the other layers could still be reused. And what's really great about this is that this can uh, happen completely in the registry. When you run a build like this, you will notice that it may be like completes within a second. And that's because it never actually pulled down any layers. It never pushed any layers. Only thing it did was basically send the new image configuration to the registry that reordered those layers. And, uh, and that was the only thing that, that needed to happen. Uh, so when you use uh, cache from, when you're using previous cache in your builds and want to make those things faster, then uh, definitely recommend it to switch, uh, to update your Docker files and make them use the dashes link flag. Okay, thanks, Dennis. Um... Uh, there is another feature uh, that, we, that I want to talk about today. Uh, this is a capturing build information. So build information, what it is, some key points about this. So as of today, um, Docker image has not really self-descriptive, um, like some basic information available at build time that could be useful for developers on DevOps. Um, so I'll show you this new feature of BuildKit to leverage this build information structure generated with build metadata that allow you to see, for example, the sources. Uh, as of today, there is the Docker images, Git repositories, HTTP URL, as well as configuration that were used for the build. So let, let's see now uh, with a simple Docker file with stages that contain dependencies. In the build command we see, you see up there, uh, we are using the metadata file flag, which will write the bit result metadata in the metadata JSON file. This flag allows to retrieve metadata information about your build result, like the digest of your resulting image and no build information. You can think of metadata file as an improved version of the old ID file flag that only lets you capture the resulting image ID. Building this Docker file will produce the following build information metadata. As you can see, build attributes are passed at the build time so that's great, but we have also the build sources that are also compliant with our Docker file, and each of them are pinned with its respective digest. But that's just the first step. Uh, we have, we can, you can also, for example, push build info metadata of your image and does not require any extra step. Just push your image to your favorite registry and it will be embedded in the image configuration. Now, if you want to check uh, the build information for an exact image, image let's say the build kit one, uh, you can use the buildx image tools command. And here, here is the result uh, when we check this build information for this image. 
So what's next? Uh, that's the first step uh, to use build info today. The purpose now is to increase uh, the transparency of the components inside uh, the, the image uh, of our container so that variabilities can be tracked and fixed easily. Uh, it's just, as I say, the first step in the security supply chain journey and build repossibility, build repossibility, but we want to go further with the community. So we would like to bring uh, SBOM to our containers image through build kits. Oh, also, by the way, don't miss the SBOM talk with Encore uh, later today. Okay, as the, my last features, let's talk now about a new feature called name build context. Uh, before we get started with this feature, let's first understand what is a build context. So in here, I have a Docker file again, and we're copying this uh, file called par into the container. And where this file is coming from is, is if you trace it back, it's coming from this path that you passed uh, when you ran the build command. And this is what we call build context. As you can see, you can only pass one build context. So there's only one path out there. So every, all the files that you use as part of your build they need to be some way contained inside this path. And that's quite limiting for lots of, lot of uh, like project layouts. So, and here, if you look at this other copy that we also have, we see that this file foo is not coming from a build context. This is our multi-stage build case. It's coming from another stage called build. So it's coming from basically something called build and uh, something that has a name, name built there. So, and what uh, the name the build context feature is, is basically a combination of those two things. So there's a new dashes build context flag that allows you to define uh, new directories and new locations that you want to expose to your builds. And you assign them names. And then on the Docker file side, you can access all those locations same way as you could previously access the, the build stages in multi-stage builds. And as I showed before, the value of this build context can be any path from your machine, like, like you put it with your main build context, but it can also be a Git repository, uh, tarball, things like that. Another feature that uh, is available is that you can actually initialize your build context with another image. So in that case, you would use this last example where, where you have the docker dash image prefix with your, your image name. And that case is important, for example, in the cases where you, well, when you have your Docker file that is using a release version of, your, of some image, but you want to run your build, for example, with a staging version instead, and you don't want to make changes to the Docker file itself. So in here, for example, I'm running a build and I'm defining as a build context that uh, whenever there's an Alpine, you should actually use the staging version of Alpine instead. And uh, so I define a build context there. And now whenever the Docker file builder will see that uh, there's a from Alpine command, it will not actually use Alpine. It will use the staging version of the Alpine. Uh, this is an example of uh, the usual case where you have two lo source locations that you want to expose to your build. So now I have source one and source two, and I can uh, assign separate uh, locations where those files appear. You can also see that in the case of app2, I can access the parent directory. So there's no restriction anymore that the files need to be inside your working directory and so on. And uh, on top of that, there's another way how you can use the name context and that is with the build expect command. So build expect command, if you have not yet used it, is our higher level build command that allows you to predefine your build configurations into targets and give them names. So later on, you can just build the target by name and it will figure out all the configuration that this specific build requires. So in this case, I have defined two targets called, uh, one is the base target and one is app target. And in the app target, I have defined my build context. So in here, you could define all the regular build context values that, that I showed before, but uh, Additionally, you can also set a new value in here that is with the target prefix. And in th this case, the value of this build context will actually be the result of that, uh, of that other target called base. So in here, I have 
run the docker build x pay cap to build this target this uh, now builds my docker file my docker file is using this image my user base app but instead of using the release version of this uh, image we are actually building our local version from this other docker file and using the result of that build as the as our base image so this allows you to create pipelines for completely independent docker files build as part of your your single build command and previously to do this you would have needed like a registry where you would build your first image and then put it to the like some staging registry and and then pull it down and and it was quite messy like this and this of course like works as well with all their multi-platform images and even with build clusters when it's building on multiple machines okay before we wrap up uh let's talk about uh some other features uh, we want to showcase uh, for the end of this presentation. So let's talk about the open telemetry in BuildX. Um, it allows you to connect to open telemetry collectors uh, and trace back uh, and forth between the client and the server side. Uh, it can be really useful to see the inside of your build and see uh, the pain points uh, and build time it takes for some instructions. You can also add uh, additional trace points uh, in your own applications that run inside BuildKits. So in addition to the tracing, we've also made some improvements to our build output. So for example, now when you get an error, we will show you a source map of your actual source code and, and show the exact line where that error happened. So you can quickly see the, what's going on and go to your source code and fix your error. In some cases, we can also just give you a hint of what kind of fix you might want to do there. And we also have the support for warnings for non-critical errors. Okay, uh, as you saw, there are plenty of things to check out and new capabilities you can use to make your builds even more powerful, secure, and performant. We only had time to give you a quick preview of some of the features. Please do check out the slide deck where we have included this, the link to Morturo uh, written documentation and blog post describing the feature we just showed. Yeah, everything you saw here today is already available in the latest release versions of BuildX and BuildKit. So everything is already included in your Docker desktop uh, installations. So please test and provide feedback. All our projects are also open source. So uh, you're welcome to get involved and contribute back. Uh, you can reach us at GitHub or in the Docker community Slack in the toolkit channel. Uh, thank you very much and please enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you, bye.